With degrees in criminal justice and ethics, over 30 years of investigative experience, a recognized expert in investigation procedures, and an expert in criminal and social behaviors, I am Rick Decker, and this is A Shadow of Truth. Greetings from Sunny Charleston, South Carolina. Baked potatoes, pumpkin pie, zucchini, cabbage, and yellow squash with gravy. Sounds good, but what if that wasn't all that was being served for Thanksgiving dinner? Today, we are examining the Australian Black Widow, Catherine Knight. Before we get too far gone into the show, I want to thank you for listening. You can reach out to the show at a shadow of truth podcast at gmail.com. Also, please don't forget to like and share the show on your selected platform. So let's get back into what we were talking about. The thing that we're talking about with um, Miss Knight wasn't really surrounded around Thanksgiving dinner. But the way that she acted and what she did, I thought with my off sense of humor, how appropriate. Catherine was a unique killer, and I thought extra gruesome to profile her for American Thanksgiving tradition would be kind of, like I said, an offset to my humor. Catherine was a product of an illicit affair. In fact, she, she was a twin. I have maintained over the years that killers, serial killers and other types, are all product of an environment that has triggered a biological reaction causing deviant behaviors. Catherine is no different, but her crime was extreme, to say the least. Catherine was born to Barbara Rogan and her boyfriend, Ken Knight. The family dynamic was complicated. Barbara had children with her legitimate husband, Jack Rogan. Four of them, in fact. And this affair split not only the the children, but the entire family and the town. The two families were well known and the affair spread like wildfire. So it was an embarrassment for all the proper individuals involved per se. Other than her twin, Catherine was only close to one other individual and this was her uncle, Oscar Knight. Now he passed away in 1969 because of suicide, but Miss Knight claimed that his ghost visited her frequently. And now, this relationship with the uncle will prove later on to be probably the most solid relationship that she ever had in her life. Catherine's father, Ken Knight, was a known alcoholic. He was also known, well known, in fact, for his violent tendencies. Plus, he had a habit of using intimidation to get his way. And Ken, after the affair ended and married Barbara, wasn't really kind to her. It had been reported that he raped Barbara up to 10 times a day. And Now, Barbara herself, uh, she was a piece of work, to say the least. She complained to her daughters about how she hated sex and how she hated men. And on top of that, Barbara would share intimate details of her sex life. And I mean details about her sex life with her two daughters, particularly with Catherine. Now, one would think that a mother of two young girls who had been raped and beaten frequently would have made some attempt to protect her offspring. Uh, On the contrary, Catherine one time told her mom that one of her partners, and it it most likely turned out to be a um, a male family member, wanted to have sex with her. And good old mom just told her to suck it up, shut up, stop complaining. Catherine had been raped by several members of her family, although not by her dad until she was 11 years old. And she tried to tell mom this, and mom just wasn't having any of it. I know through my years of experience and education that being victimized over and over, particularly from a young age, causes rage, a rage that can 
only be explained as violent, vile, and even sometimes murderous. People in general, males and females, who are subjected to sexual abuse are scarred even if therapy helps. Memories linger. It heightens one's fears. It causes outbursts, making victims overly vigilant to protect themselves. They are forever trying to stop from being hurt over and over. And to those in the outside that don't know or don't understand what it's like to have that be that type of victim, they look at these people as overreacting over nothing to where the victims see everything as a threat. And I, when I say victim, I mean survivors too. No matter the scenario, these individuals are always hypervigilant to protect themselves. And the longer the abuse goes on, the harder it is for them to overcome those memories and fears. And Catherine had a lifetime of this abuse. Now, I want to go off track a little bit. And if you haven't gathered with my shows by now, it's not just about people who kill. It's about raising awareness, awareness of what causes behaviors, what causes the dehumanization of these individuals because they are human and things have happened to them. We try to find a way to explain why they have come to be where they are, where they are and become the people that commit these deviant deeds. When you strip away the acts of cannibalism, murder, torture, you find an individual with real psychological stress and issues that cause biological triggers that create dysfunction. Okay, back to Miss Knight. Anyway, she was abused sexually and, and physically. She was shunned, and she was a product of an affair. The family history has shown that even some of her half-siblings have had run-ins with the law, but our focus today is not on her siblings or the total dynamics of her family. It's just the dynamics in part, and we want to look at Mary Catherine. All the trauma that she had experienced, as one might imagine, can affect one's behavior and mental growth over time. It was reported that at school, Catherine acted odd over small incidents, incidents that would not really matter to the individual that had not been victimized, but it see, appear to have caused her to develop dual personalities. They noticed in school that she was not of one type of personality, that she changed with her environment. And when the change happened, she was horrifically angry. And then as soon as the incident passed, she returned back to what they called normal. Catherine was struggling in school. In fact, she couldn't even read or write, and she left school at the age of 15 years old. Now, with that, even though she didn't finish school and she couldn't read or write, she was able to gain employment. She worked in a factory cutting clothing. She later went to work in a slaughterhouse as a deboner, um, helping fillet the meat and separate the bones and the muscles. And in fact, in that position, she was doing so well, they gave her a set of her own butcher knives. Now, Catherine took these tools of her trade home and hung them up over her bed. In fact, she had said once that if I need them, I'll have them. That's why I put them above my my bed, which isn't really unusual until you put it into context, her willingness to fight at a moment's notice and become violent. And she was known for fighting in bars. 
and she was also known being very skilled with those knives and using them as a threat against others, even if it wasn't in an effort to protect herself. She would pull them when she felt threatened. So Catherine hooked up with a co-worker named uh, David Kellett. We say, and it's a common saying, and w- that people are either merry or attracted to the type of dysfunction that we grow up with. And Miss Catherine was no different. David was a drinker, but he wasn't a skilled fi- fighter. She beat his ass regularly. Um, many times they were in fights and bars, and he lost each and every time. In fact, on their wedding day, Catherine's mom, Barbara, told David, you need to watch out for this one or she'll kill you if you mess around with her. I, I don't know about you, but if my mother-in-law or anyone else would have said that kind of crap to me on my wedding day, I don't care how big and bad you think you are. With somebody like Catherine, you run like hell. I'm sure any sober individual in this world would if they heard something like that on their wedding day. Well, David, (laughs) David wasn't that smart. He didn't listen. See, Catherine's behavior was just laying dormant, uh, her violent tendencies, until after she married David. Because on their wedding night, she strangled or attempted to strangle David because he fell asleep after only having sex with her three times and wouldn't wake up. She got so mad at him at, while they were married that when David came home late from a dart game, she was furious. So she decided she was going to slam a frying pan into the back of his head. Now, David, luckily, you know, he got away with just a skull fracture. And when police arrived, Catherine was so skillful. She had David convinced that she was sorry. It was a result of her being pregnant and convinced him not to file charges against her. Now, not long after that, I mean, eventually they they had the child, okay? In fact, they had two children, both girls. And Catherine, she was getting attention after the birth of their first daughter, um, who was Melissa. And um, Catherine became enraged at David and took the stroller with Melissa in it, slamming it around, up and down, onto the concrete, in public, and then eventually went and placed Melissa on the railway and left her. Fortunately for Melissa, a townsman um, found her laying on the tracks moments before the train would have run her over. Catherine was arrested and placed in a mental hospital overnight. She was able to sign herself out, and they cited postpartum depression as the rationale for her behavior. One would think that after that, violence would have curtailed or or stopped, but no, it escalated. Um, her and, and David, their relationship was very, very up and down and problematic. In fact, she, Catherine had taken her knives with her, went out looking for a woman because she saw David's car somewhere and was going to kill that woman because she thought that the woman was the one David was having the affair with. And when that woman got away, she took a young boy hostage and threatened to slit his throat. Luckily, she was eventually disarmed by police. 
she was once again hospitalized, stress, and released the next day. Later, she met a guy named David Saunders. Now, Saunders and Knight had an on-again, off-again relationship, even when she was with Kelty. Okay? And Knight and Saunders, they also had a child together, Sarah. And Sarah's birth prompted Saunders to try and make the tumultuous relationship work. So he went and put money down on a house and let Catherine decorate it. Well, Catherine ended up decorating it in a very macabre motif using knives, machetes, skulls, horns, and animal skins. The entire house was covered walls and ceilings and floors with all this hideous, macabre, horrific motif. Catherine had, we all, like I've said before, had a temper. And one night, she and Saunders got into an argument. And she hit him in the face with an iron and stabbed him in the stomach with scissors. Now, I don't know about you, but at that point, I would have been gone. And Saunders did go make a police report. However, Catherine convinced the police that Saunders was the threat and was granted an order of protection because she told police she was afraid of him. I know, I know. Class act, right? I mean, wow. Catherine was full of violence, and I would speculate that she had this need, this desire to exact revenge against all the men who had previously taken advantage of her. But unfortunately, the men that she dated and married were not the men that had taken advantage of her. To say the least, Catherine was a force not to be reckoned with. I mean, nobody you shouldn't mess around with, with Catherine. She made that evidently clear. Catherine was very vile and violent. No, nothing or no one was safe from her. I mean, come on. She tried to kill her oldest daughter. And in fact, she killed Saunders's puppy. Just slit the damn dog's throat because he wouldn't comply with her wishes. She stabbed men. She strangled them until she eventually killed one of them. Enter John Price. Mr. Price was her one victim that she killed, that she was managed to kill. Mr. Price was the father of three. Knight had met Mr. Price and, like other relationships, had had an affair with him. So what caused Price to be her victim, the one that she killed? And at this juncture, I would have to say what I'm about to say is speculative, but rejection. Price was a long line of men that she took control over, except with Price, she couldn't control him. She wanted to get married, and he refused to marry her. In fact, he was very afraid of her. And he had went to the police and made a police report and said, I have to go home tonight because if I don't, she's going to harm my children. There was an instant where at one time she stabbed him in the chest. And then because uh, that he went to the police and, and wouldn't marry her, she videotaped 
things that he had taken from his job of 17 years. Now, granted, he shouldn't have stolen from his job, but he worked in a mine and what, and he took what he thought was junk. And he was so frightened that he told his co-workers, you know, if I don't come back to work tomorrow, I'm probably dead. So what makes Catherine more notable, I guess I would say, was the way that she killed and disposed of Mr. Price's body, or tried to dispose, I should say. So Mr. Price went home that night, and surprise, surprise, he didn't make it to work the next day. The neighbors, knowing about the violence and his concerns about his demise, became worried the, when his car was still home and hadn't been moved to work such early in the morning. So the neighbor went snooping around and knocked on the window. To his horror, seeing blood splattered through the window all throughout the room. So he went back to his home and he called the police. Police arrived, kicked in the door, and found Miss Knight sitting in a chair, drinking wine. And they saw that John had been, Mr. Price, had been stabbed a total of 37 times. Through the investigation, they found that um, she stabbed John after having sex after he fell asleep. Now, when he woke up to the first stab, he tried to escape to no avail. He was stabbed dead. Blood was all over. And yet they couldn't find John. With the amount of splatter and blood all over that they, they found. It is obvious that this murder was a, a result of severe anger that accumulated by years of abuse and rejection. And it's obvious that she just lost control. And because she couldn't control Mr. Price, she had to end him. Within hours of his death, Catherine had skinned him and hung his remains on a meat hook in the door in a doorway of a family room upside down. She had cut off his head and started cooking his body parts. And Remember at the beginning of the show, I had talked about baked potato, pumpkin pie, zucchini, and cabbage. Well, ladies and gentlemen, she was cooking his body parts. And she had already set the table. You see, she was serving the baked potato, pumpkin pie, zucchini, cabbage, yellow squash, and gravy. The meat was Mr. Price. And she had set up place settings at the table with notes uh, to each of the children and set a placemat for each of them. See, ladies and gentlemen, she was going to feed dad to the kids without them knowing who or what they were about ready to eat, as one can imagine those of us that are not clinically scarred or insane would be effective very negatively for a long time. In fact, police officers today that had been to that crime scene are still undergoing therapy for this crime. And that wasn't this long ago. I mean, this happened back in 2001. So this is relatively recent. Now, the court claimed that she had a personality disorder, and I would venture to definitely agree with that. Now, I would also say that she was malignant, vindictive, narcissistic tendencies, although 
not a serial killer per se. I believe she follows some of the typologies. She was motivated by revenge. She was a disorganized killer, and I believe that's why she failed to kill the other men. She struggled in relationships, just like most disorganized killers do. And, but yet she was stabilized in the selection of her victims and her methodology. Now, we could speculate all day long about the cannibalism and, you know, cooking and feeding to other people, her beloved husband, but she never really killed anybody else other than a puppy. I mean, the murder, uh, she tried to kill her daughter, so that's just an attempted murder. And yes, she may have tried to kill the other men, but the only one she really did kill was Mr. Price. I think she is not a serial killer only because she failed during the attacks of the other men. She was a hedonistic killer. She killed out of personal gratification, craving domination over men. She killed to obtain power. This was obvious. She killed an animal and attempted to kill her daughter because she had poor coping skills. She couldn't cope with rejection. And when she got mad at one thing, she got mad at everything. The most horrifying about Miss Knight is that she tried to dispose of Mr. Price by feeding his remains unknowingly to family. Now, that in of itself is not that horrific. I mean, we've seen it before. Um, Pee Wee Gaskin, hell, he fed some of his victims to living captors who he intended to kill in and eat anyway. He just didn't come up with the idea, as far as we know, to feed his victims' remains to their families. The mind is a delicate thing. I mean, our organic computer can only process so much stress before it malfunctions. We are affected by those around us and our experiences determine the outcomes of our lives. You know, at any given time, ladies and gentlemen, we're but a sliver away from our own demise and It's only by the grace of a higher power and circumstances that we continue to be here another day. So on this eve of the holidays coming for everybody around the world, embrace today and those around you, because we never know when the end is near, quite literally. It is our responsibility to uplift and not destroy each other. And at some point, we will all face the reaper. And I tell you now, when I leave this world, I want to be remembered as a wide brush stroke and not as a point of a number two pencil. Take care of one another. Enjoy your holiday. Carpe diem. <laughs>